So uh, the title of this talk is uh, How to Reclaim Your Data Dignity in a Few Clicks. Um, let me just start by saying uh, my name is Shiv Malik, uh, and I work for Streamer. I'm the head of growth there. And um, and look, it's really great to be part of NonCon. You know, we kind of expected all of our events to be cancelled uh, for the next you know three, four, five months up till September. Um, and uh, so it's really nice to sort of join online and uh, and have this thing be organised like in you know in in, in such a sort of great uh, in you know really quickly. Um, it's an amazing effort by the organisers. So. Um, I don't know how much you heard of Faris's talk, but actually this was supposed to come before Faris's talk. Um, it's a bit more of an explainer on, on what we did, but um, so some of it might be a little bit of a repeat, but let's see. Um, okay, so let me just tell you a bit more really about myself first. Um, so I'm a former investigative journalist for The Guardian um, turned evangelist for the new data economy. And, uh, and this is me back in 2012. Um, I actually made it onto the news weirdly because I deleted my Facebook and somehow um, it was a, you know, it's one of these rare things uh, back then. Uh, so they invited me to explain myself uh, and sort of ask, you know, you know, what, why the hell have you done this? And it was about around the time of Facebook's IPO. And um, sorry, just give me one second. honey. So it was around the time of Facebook's IPO and... Um, you know, my argument was simply this, that, look, Facebook is, you know, a, a sort of, a, it's, a, it's a pretty terrible platform. Um, and I described, I said, you know, we've all turned into basically info slaves and watching um, you know, Mark Zuckerberg take even more money out of the system, in a sense, was even more galling. You know, it's a way of monetizing our shared hopes and dreams and communications. And the newsreader's retort was pretty blunt. He said, look, you've lost this debate. Um, you know, there's around then there was, a, you know, 200, 300 million, I think, Facebook users. He said that, you know, these people just disagree with you. And I think they were right. Um, and I think what was clear to me back then was that if you were going to fight Facebook, somehow you had to do it with tech. There wasn't, you know, the policy wasn't going to work. Uh, I don't think changing people's minds was simply going to work. Um, what you needed is some kind of technological solution. So look, fast forward to late 2017. Um, I'd left The Guardian uh, and what was my sort of dream job in a sense, and partly because actually Facebook and Google had eviscerated our advertising. And, uh, and so there just wasn't enough money and, and it was a very depressing place to be. Um, and that made me even more motivated in a sense to go after Facebook or Google in some way. But I joined a, a group called uh, a Streamer and a good number of you may already know what, in a sense, or heard of Streamer, but they're an open source project and they did their crypto raise in, in 2017, um, sort of around the peak. Um, and, uh, uh, and what they brought to the table was uh, a, a number of things, which we'll go over in, the, in, in a second. Um, but what they've done now is pretty, in my, in my view, certainly, pretty mind-blowing. Um, they've managed really to uh, make a thing called a data union. Um, so they've created the framework for developers to come along and build a data union. So what's a data union? Um, and and it's, it's a way of enabling individuals uh, to crowd sell, crowdsource and then crowd sell their personal information. So it's a way of individuals to bring their data together, to aggregate it and to crowd sell their information. Um, Glenn Weil, if you know Glenn Weil, um, he's uh, with Radical Exchange and he does a few things with uh, Vitalik. Um, and Jaron Lanier, he works with Jaron Lanier. Um, they would perhaps call this a, a MID, which is a mediator of individual data, but that's a bit of a mouthful. So we, we went for data union, um, a bit akin to credit union as a name. So I, I think it's actually a really powerful framework, such a powerful tool that it might actually in the end bring down Facebook itself. So let me just go over perhaps the state we're in. I'm going to try and make this quick because I think we all kind of know this stuff uh, pretty well. Um, at the moment, we live in, well, this. Uh, and if anyone knows what this is, it's, uh, it's the panopticon. Uh, Jeremy Bentham, the philosopher, kind of envisaged a way of running a prison. And, uh, and this was his design. 
And actually someone went ahead and built it, um, which is quite remarkable. Uh, <laughs> I don't think it was an actual, it was meant to be some kind of replica rather than an actual prison in a sense. Um, and in, and it, it resembles in many ways the current data economy. Uh, here is Google and Facebook. They have insight uh, into pretty much everything that everyone around them is doing in the digital space, which is, you know, uh, we're talking billions of people here. And this is us um, in one of these little cells um, being monitored and spied on. And we have some insight into stuff around us, but that's pretty much it, right? Uh, so it's a world of, if you want, data oligarchs and data serfs, right? Or info slaves. Um, and out of that panopticon hell have, you know, what are the retorts to that? Um, well, there's been sort of these three visions um, for uh, doing things differently, if you want. Um, the first one is the, the open data vision, right? So uh, Tim Berners-Lee, founder of the internet, uh, the World Wide Web, um, set up uh, the, the ODI, uh, which is the o Open Data Institute, uh, about seven and a half, eight years ago, uh, with the mission that, you know, all data in the world should be open. Um, especially if it's coming from governments, they should share that. Um, but, you know, that's not excluded to them. Uh, anyone who has these big data sets, they should unsilo it. And all the world's data, in a sense, should be open for people to utilize, for researchers to use. Uh, and we should all just be sharing that. Um, and that's actually been a pretty powerful vision. It's moved certain policy needles, especially in the UK, uh, with the open banking movement and, and, in a sense, GDPR portability rules have been informed by that movement as well. Um, the second thing has been the privacy or death uh, kind of crew. Uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, I know a lot of people in crypto are themselves uh, very pro-privacy. Uh, in fact, that's why a lot of people are, in fact, here. Um, uh, and, uh, I mean, I would count myself uh, amongst them as well. Mm. And the tools that they've had to deploy are actually being really successful. I mean, if you take it at the meme level, um, you know, people use Telegram and WhatsApp. Let's not uh, scrutinize necessarily the technological um, efficacy. Um, but certainly people are using these things because they believe that they give them a sense of privacy. Um, so yeah, also pretty successful. And the third retort to the kind of data uh, economy has been this ownership model. Um, it's a really old idea, like people could individually own their data and have therefore control over it, right? Both in the kind of legal sense and the technological actualities. Um, and, uh, you know, if you were watching um, Andrew Yang, the Democratic presidential candidate, you know, he um, very much uh, was a proponent of that. Um, Yuval Hariri has been another one, Will I Am, the musician. Um, and the My Data movement has actually been one of the movements in that, but it's actually been a little bit disparate uh, till now. But the main thing is that the technological su successes coming out of that, or, or, or just anything, have just been terrible. There's been nothing on that basis, right? Um, if you could name me a technology that allows people to have ownership over their data in a sense, I mean, there are a handful of them, but none of them have been in any way successful as the first two. So... There is a reason for that. And the reason is that data ownership is an infrastructure nightmare. Hey, I'm just gonna, I, I'm talking into dead air at the moment. If someone just wants to reply, just so I know that I'm still online. Yeah, you're online. You're, Great. you're here. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> it's always weird talking to dead air when you can't hear someone else's response, right? Um, okay. So let me tell you a story. Um, this is a story, this is a, a slide. It's a picture of a guy uh, the, the first guy who downloaded his data and attempted to sell it. So this is back in 2000, and the guy was called Chris Downs. Um, he's actually still a technologist now. He's pretty successful. Um, still very passionate about data ownership and stuff. But um, this is how the story went. So in 2000, he's like, hey. So he's like the first guy ever to sell his uh, personal information on the internet. Uh, he went to, he's like, hey, I want to sell my data. How am I going to do this? So he went to like 200 websites and, and downloaded his information. In fact, it turned out he had to handwrite some of it, which is why it's handwritten here. Um, printed it out, like to like, check things through, scanned it back in, um, <laughs> put it on a thumb drive. And then he's like, okay, well, how do I like sell this now? So he put it on eBay, right? Um, it's a marketplace. Why not sell data there too? Uh, and he got 300 and 
about $60 for it in today's money, uh, which is not bad. Um, you know, it's all of his sort of financial information as well and, and lots of other things. Um, so that's not too bad. And he was reflecting on that a few years ago and he said, my God, like this just hasn't changed, right? The infrastructure that I would, how would I do this today? And he said, well, pretty much the same way because there isn't anything for individuals, right? Um, so what are the issues that Chris Downs faced and still faces? Um, one is transport, right? You need to move data from one place to another. Um, the second thing is discovery, right? You need to like have it on a marketplace. And there's a refinement to that, which is that, you know, if you're a buyer, you don't want to haggle on eBay, certainly with you know, a million Chris Downses to create a database. And you, you don't want to also make, you want to make sure that the data set you're buying is, is, is not just full of junk, right? Uh, and it's standardized, et cetera, et cetera. So you need to kind of, ag people need to be able to aggregate their data together and then have it discovered on a marketplace. And then the last bit is yes, you need to pay people. Uh, and you might be like, hey, Shiv, like, what's the issue? You know, we've got, we've got fiat, we've got crypto. What's the big deal? Well, it turns out if you want to pay a million people, like three cents each, even Ethereum won't do that for you, right? We all know that the fiat banking system won't work, but even Ethereum won't do that properly. So you need to come up with some kind of bespoke uh, micropayments solution. So that's pretty difficult. Um, and this is why, at least I'd argue, why we don't have uh, the kind of infrastructure until now uh, that enables individuals to do this kind of a thing. So, yeah, I said until now, because I think we sold it, um, which is cool. Um, <laughs> I say we, I didn't really do much. Uh, other people who are much cleverer than me did. Um, so it turns out that Streamer was already like in its white paper, uh, all about building this thing on the left, the network, right? So what is it? Like it's a, a pub sub network for, for real time data that's decentralized, right? Um, it's a bit like lib P to P for those who are familiar with that or with, you know, Amazon Kinesis um, uh, or, or Apache Kafka if you're using an open source solution. Um, but it's, you know, it works uh, with, you know, nodes, um, uh, taking fees from people who actually want to subscribe to the network. Um, so they were already building that. And then they also, on the white paper was this idea to build a marketplace. And we also had experience with Ethereum, um, obviously, um, having made um, our own token, but also um, smart contracting, et cetera, et cetera. So we're really well placed to actually, you know, fulfill that criterion, it turns out. And, and a deep, rich experience in real-time data, the background of some, most of the team, most of the founding team, uh, was in algorithmic trading. So we had all the ingredients there to come up with something that might actually work for this, right? That kind of transport, the, the aggregation and discovery for the marketplace, and then the kind of micropayment solution. Um, so here's a technical outline of kind of what's going on for this data union framework that we've built. Um, by the way, was anyone, if anyone was at uh, Denver, not this year, but last year, they'll know that we kind of launched Monoplasma which is this uh, micropayment solution. So um, uh, I won't go into it into too much detail here. Um, but here's how this framework uh, works, operates. Um, you have a data source, data comes in at one end, uh, travels through the network um, and is unlocked only when a buyer pays for it and that goes through the smart contract, right? Um, and that money is then distributed back to the data source. Um, so it's actually, in a sense, a very simple really simple framework. Um, and it turns out that you can kind of exploit that in a, in a number of different ways. And um, we've already had one project. Uh, we've got a number of projects actually building out of this framework um, and, and coming up with the ideas of their own. Um, and then one of those teams that has really already had a lot of success is Swash. So Swash is, what is Swash? So Swash is, well, the world's first data union. Um, certainly coming out of this framework. Um, it has a thousand members already. Uh, in fact, it's had a, about double that, or maybe even more uh, downloads. So uh, active users is uh, over a thousand. Um, it's a browser plugin. Um, so it can sit in, in Chrome, Firefox, et cetera. Um, and it garners your data and we're gonna see it in a second. So I won't go into too much of a description. Uh, you download it, you permission it to say, I'm happy to share this, that, and th these data points, um, like my surfing uh, behavior, or, or, um, or w when I go to Facebook, I'm happy to share th this kind of you know, information. Um, 
and it sends that and because it runs locally you're the one selling it uh, sending it through the network to a, a, a prospective buyer and then when they pay for it when they pay for that data product it goes through the smart contract and is redistributed out to both swash who make 30 percent of the revenue or can make at this point that they're, they're saying we only want to make five percent of all revenues and then the rest of the uh, the money is then distributed by the smart contract to the end users, right? So you can start to see how, okay, well, that's just one idea. There are a good number of other ideas that come out of this. And we're already in discussions actually with enterprises who also want to think, you know, God, how can I revenue share with uh, our consumers? Um, because selling their data behind their backs doesn't work, right? I mean, that's almost proven now. Selling data behind consumers' backs in the end will get you in trouble and you'll have to close your operation down. So you need to do it with their explicit consent. And also, I would suggest revenue share with them to make that consent really obvious, right? Okay, now I'm going to do something tricky. I want to show you Swash. And I don't know if this is going to work. So let's see. Um, da -da -da -da. We've had one demo today, which was without any issues. So I'm hoping that you're keeping the trend here. Okay, let's see. Uh, okay, let's just, there we go. I could have made that a little bit easier. Um, but here we go. Can you see that? Can you see Swash? Yes, we can. Lovely. Okay, well, this is going to work a treat then. Um, <laughs> so here's the website. Um, you normally just say get swash and you'd uh, take you to the Chrome store or whatever, or, you know, Mozilla Firefox store. Um, I've already downloaded it. Um, I'm going to switch that on. It tells me when I switch it on that I've got 0 0.6 data at the moment. Um, actually I had a lot more, but I had to, for various reasons, uh, uh, delete my, uh, particular application and, and reinstall it. But um, that's a little ticker that basically keeps the uh, amount you've earned. So let's just go into the settings and get a deeper view into what it does. Um, okay, so first up is that earnings page. It, it automatically spins up a wallet, right? And it shows you a private key. This is all just for you. And it's all run locally, as I mentioned before. Um, it allows you, actually, when you have it, it the, the modules are not all permissioned. Um, it's just usually search. Um, uh, as a default, but um, I've turned most of them on. Um, somehow feel uncomfortable sharing my Twitter data, which is weird because actually I tweet that stuff, it's all public, so I should switch it on. But um, <laughs> let's look at the search. Um, uh, you pick a search engine, Google is obviously at the top there, and you can say, like, I'm happy to share all of these things, like my search query, the ads, click link, search result, et cetera, et cetera. Again, with surfing, you know, you go to your URL bar, like I'm happy to share the visited pages, the visiting graph, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And all of this information, you know, we had a specialist look at this. You know, this is the kind of information that you can't really get from anywhere else uh, unless you're spying on people, right? Uh, people might who are pro-privacy might be uncomfortable with this, but if people are saying, I'm happy to share this, and lots of people, it turns out, are. We did a little bit of product research around that. Lots of people are. Um, then, um, you know, this is very rich information uh, that people are willing to pay a lot of money for. Uh, and the companies that already provide this stuff basically do it behind consumers' backs um, and are overtly spying on people. Uh, and when they get found out, they have to close down. Um, and there's a couple of examples of that happening in the last um, year or so. Uh, one of those companies with Jumpshot. So um, this is the data delay module. Um, and uh, it allows you to delay stuff that you're sending. Um, uh, so, and then there's uh, other advanced features like uh, the privacy slider down here, which allows you to set global privacy levels um, to low, medium, or high. You can see that, for example, the time string um, is down to the day uh, with medium, but with high, you're just on the year that you sent it, right? Um, so it just gives you a modicum more privacy on all those aspects there. Uh, again, I won't go too much into it. So um, let me just go to the streamer marketplace. Um, this is our website. And then you go to apps and marketplace and you go, look, hey, look, I want to purchase. So this is what it looks like from the buyer side, if you want. You go tap in Swash, you find a product, you see it's there. Um, I've already purchased it. Um, so that's really handy. Uh, 
and let's just have an okay uh it might be a bit iffy but um you can have a uh, inspect some of that live search stream right uh, over here this is you know the result of a thousand plus people coming together um and uh and and crackling their information right so you can click in on certain things uh, uh aspects of that you can see the kind of you know can start to inspect the data this is clearly someone who's german um who's who's done a search and this is the kind of machine readable information that they've returned um i think that's pretty much it um are there any questions at this point or actually i'm going to just go back to um just that last bit of the presentation so where's next um okay let me just give you a quick rundown as I mentioned before, we, we had a valuation of Swash data, and we think it's worth about you know tens of millions. Um, so potentially 30 to 150 million in the next three to uh, seven years is how much we think Swash can scale. And that's obviously one data union built off this framework. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they've got first mover advantage. They've really picked something that's really smart, and they're also going to be doing it for mobile as well. Um, so they're, they're a Turkish team, by the way, I forgot to mention. Um, and there's about three or four of them. Um, and, uh, and they're really, you know, they really made a lot of technical progress in the last year. Um, it can scale. We believe it can. We did some, again, product research on this, and it turns out a lot of people, once they understand the concept of a data union, um, that it's a bit like a credit union in that sense, about cl clubbing together, um, they, they like the idea. And if they like the idea and then they see something like Swash operate, then they love it. Um, three out of 10 people don't like the idea and then they really hate it when they see Swash. So it's a bit uh, like Marmite, as we'd say in the, in the UK, you either love it or hate it. But the good news is more people love it than hate it. Um, so that's nice. Um, uh, and more than that, just on that point about it scaling, you know, a lot of projects obviously facing on-ramping problems, right? You've got to get the token first to operate whatever it is, uh, the DAP or, um, the, you know, a network or some other blockchain. This case, you just do what you do in the Web2 world and you get paid in crypto. And it's not a, like, a oh, you get paid in crypto because, like, you know, you're doing real work here that's of value because people are actually paying for it at the end of the day. It's not like the app that's paying for this, it's outside buyers who are like, I really want this data. So we're actually, this is an on-ramp into crypto. Uh, and that's really cool. And it's the only way to do it, right? Because of the micropayments issue. Um, so it can't be done any other way in some other kind of fiat way. Um, and more data unions are coming. Um, we've actually already established a, a DAO uh, data union. So um, we're working together with Blockstack and Colony to create a couple of those. Um, uh, again, it's a, it's, that one is a mobile app, um, but imagine them being run by a DAO, right? Because at the moment, DAOs are mainly, by and large, like hedge funds, right? Very few of them are actually businesses with revenue. Um, so that's going to be really fun running these things as DAOs. Um, and finally, the legislative wins are in our favor. Um, the new Californian Act um, is really clear about, uh, you know, telling people, um, gi giving people the right to say, you know, I don't want you company X to sell my data anymore. So you can instruct and you can get a third party to instruct those companies to say, I don't want you to sell my data. That's really powerful because, you know, if you're a member of a data union, you can tell the other company, don't sell it. So then you get an exclusive right effectively uh, for the data union. And GDPR Article 20 is about to be ramped up, uh, we hope next year in a way that uh, will allow portability to happen really flexibly. So you can take data from Netflix or Spotify and you can claim that, the, the stuff that you generate on those sites as your own. Um, and they won't be able to stop you. So imagine those two things combined. You know, I can say to Netflix, you can't sell my data and I can um, take it from you as well. 